who aren't able uh, to attend um, today. So just bringing your attention to that. Um, thank you all for being here and welcome um, to this Valuing Practice Education conference. Um, this conference is, is being uh, put on by the West Midlands Social Work Teaching Partnership. Um, we're one of 27 accredited teaching partnerships um, across the country. And we have uh, 28 uh, partners consisting of local authorities and trusts and higher education institutions as well. And so we collaborate with our partners um, to try and develop and maintain quality social work teaching and training um, across the, the West Midlands region. Um, so it's of extreme importance to the teaching partnership um, to value the contribution that practice educators make to the profession um, and building a strong workforce. And so this uh, this conference is all about that, about celebrating practice educators and um, and practice education in general and, and the role and everything um, that practice educators do. Um, and so to start us off, I'm handing over um, to Annie Murr, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Wolverhampton. Um, and a bit of an expert in all things practice education. Um, so Annie's going to uh, going to to open our conference um, with her with her um, opening speech and presentation. So I'm going to hand over to Annie now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deborah, and uh, welcome uh, from welcome to everybody from me as well. So um, and it is as as ever uh, a privilege to be able to talk with practice educators and certainly to have been uh, invited to offer this uh, opening address to open this conference which i hope is going to be exciting and illuminating and educative supportive motivating and uh, all learning and sharing together that that is always fantastic so we're celebrating practice educators and we're celebrating practice education and just starting then with what does it mean to celebrate and to celebrate um, is about praising something, to praise something, to praise it widely and to show appreciation for it. So we're praising practice education and we're, so, we're showing appreciation for practice education within our conference. And um, when we're looking at this, I've kind of thought in this opening address, I could just say, OK, so what is it that's appreciated by us between ourselves? What do practice educators appreciate about practice education? What do our students appreciate about us? What is it within social work education that is praised about what we do when we are praised? Maybe there's a little hint that um, there are a feeling at times that we don't always get the acknowledgement that um, that we deserve, but um, certainly the West Midlands Social Work Teaching Partnership uh, has us uh, at its heart. And what what does our profession appreciate about us as practice educators? So that's the the four areas that I want to look through uh, in this opening address. What do we appreciate? What do our students appreciate? What does social work education appreciate? And what does our profession appreciate? about us. Uh, thank you, Adam. Next, that's the word I need to say. OK, so I think uh, Jane is uh, with us and uh, you'll be pleased to know I sought Jane's permission before uh, putting her name up uh, on this slide. So a few years back, um, there was a session that I was doing and I was interviewing people and talking to practice educators and I invited uh, practice educators to write a haiku. I still do actually from time to time uh, invite practice educators to write a haiku because it is it can be quite an interesting way to kind of hone down what it is that we think about what we're doing. And a haiku is a form of poem. It has five syllables, it has seven syllables and then five. So it has a rhythmic pattern. And Jane's that has stayed with me, I, it's been very memorable to me and I've carried it for a number of years uh, in, a, in a positive and productive way for me. Seeing students grow, that's what's appreciated about it. Seeing students grow, sharing learning, I learn too. Great future workers. 
And so this idea that uh, we can appreciate uh, our own role in that we see students grow, but it is reciprocal. There is reciprocity. Of course, we educate. Of course, we teach. Of course, we enable learning. But in so doing, we also learn. We are also educated. And then underneath all of this is that is that hope and that desire and that motivation to give something back to the profession by creating great future workers. So I kind of, um, um, with Jane's permission, pop her haiku there uh, at the start uh, of this conference. Uh, next. So exploring more about what it means to see students grow. I, I've also talked with practice educators about what that would mean for them. Um, is it something that they appreciate? And, and fairly universally, yes, practice educators do appreciate their role in seeing students grow. And when you drill down more into that, what does that mean to them? Well, one person told me that it's the light bulb moments and the student sees what they need to do and why they need to do it. And that is, is a moment of, uh, uh, of enjoyment for practice educators, but hopefully also a realisation um, that, that, that they can appreciate that they have helped the student with that. It's when the penny drops and the student gets something. This particular student told me she didn't know anything about child development, so I made a quiz. You know, just like that, at the drop of a hat, practice educators, we just make a quiz. And this student, she knew all the answers and the penny dropped as she realised how much she knew. And another practice educator has said to me, it's seeing the jigsaw pieces coming together and knowing that we've helped that. We're the person helping the student to make those connections. So these are the kind of things that we can appreciate, hopefully, in our own role. You may use a different metaphor, but hopefully you're getting in touch with um, what it is that you are, you are appreciating um, uh, about your role and can appreciate and praise within yourself. Next. OK, so what is it that the students can say to us? Good job, practice educator. What is it that students appreciate about uh, us when we when we're fulfilling practice educator uh, role well? Um, so it's our, the, the, our ability to form relationships with them based on trust and Honesty. Now, there is a kind of a, 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 a when you to unpack what people mean by honesty, um, sometimes it means being honest about the student's progression from both the student side. They want that and the practice educator wants to be honest about that. Uh, sometimes it's about being honest about the reality of social work practice. But there's different kinds of things that 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 that. Um, different stakeholders want us to be honest about. Students appreciate us, but they, assume, they appreciate practice educators who are supportive, nurturing, address well-being, have warm relationships with them, who, I guess, who have time for them, um, who aren't so burdened by the amount of work that they are also doing, uh, that they cannot create some space for the student. And um, students appreciate practice educators who, who can be honest about their own work as well. Students appreciate um, practice educators who can offer supervision that connects theory and practice, that enables us to create links between the knowledge base of our work and our, our, our practice in social work. They appreciate supervision that creates a safe space for reflection and to learn from mistakes. So although having said above that, um, that students want nurturing, warm uh, relationships, they don't want them cosy and cosseted. A number of students want to be able to develop and want to know that there is a safe space in which they can learn from mistakes and be able to talk about those uh, honestly. And also students appreciate practice educators being able to give examples from their own practice about how they have learned. And of course, uh, there are the, the, the students appreciate uh, how we can, how practice educators support them uh, in uh, fulfilling the requirements of, of their assessed portfolios. Thank you. Next.
OK, so other maybe um, so, so, so the previous slide was maybe kind of global things that uh, research and conversation with students shows that they appreciate, but then specifically uh, things that students have told me uh, about in the last two years. Uh, the first one was a, a student, uh, a male student who was um, home during the pandemic as a lone parent with four children and uh, his practice educator actually interestingly enough his male practice educator going out of his way to support that student through a placement um uh and I kind of just want to add another one on top of this here, she says, just checking the time. Um, so the, there's that particular practice educator. Now, this isn't a story from a student. This is a story of something I witnessed. And there I was talking with a practice educator and the practice educator was sat in their kitchen. And behind them in this kitchen was the, um, the fridge door. And to that fridge door, there was these magnets of, of three lists. The and I said, what, what, what what's going on on the in the paperwork behind me or behind you at being nosy hoping I wasn't uh, intruding into something too personal and the guy that well okay these lists are one of them is are the students deadlines and the students work that's got to be done and then her own two children's school work and you know practice educators who were at home um, juggling their own work uh, juggling student um, um deadlines and requirements and their own children's homeschooling it was extraordinary and on the one hand i kind of want to uh, ensure that what we do is praise ourselves uh, praise yourselves for for managing that and being with that but also um, you know, we 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 rode those peaks and troughs and we continue to ride the peaks and troughs of the amount of work. But sometimes there is just one of those waves that raises too high and crashes down on us. And, you know, um, we can talk about resilience and sometimes something will flatten us. And I guess one of the things things we're about as well is supporting each other and picking each other up and not creating a culture in which it is not okay sometimes to um, be overwhelmed uh, uh, and, and to need support to get back in the boat and ride those waves. So students appreciate practice educators who go this extra mile. So uh, this, uh, this student who was being um, um, supported uh, through his placement whilst he himself was um, homeschooling his four children. Um, student who told me about um, struggling through a placement and the um, practice educator increasing temporarily the frequency of supervision to meet them more often to support them through that struggle. This autumn, there is an international student on the MA in social work at, at Wolverhampton University uh, who, who, who had uh, little direct knowledge of social welfare systems in England and um, a practice educator has gone out of her way to support that international student to understand um, uh, her way around uh, those welfare systems uh, in England. And all of the work that practice educators have done in setting up check-ins and catch-ups in addition to supervision um, to, to use uh, technology innovatively, um, which we may be coming on to next if I say next, and let's see whether that is the case from memory. Yeah, OK. So looking at what we appreciate, what practice educators appreciate about themselves, what students appreciate about us. But then, you know, social work education generally um, has a lot to appreciate practice educators for in how practice educators have adapt to creating new ways to undertake direct observations of students practice and to learn and develop the use of technology in new ways to support and assess students as we've become familiar with using teams um, using different online platforms to catch up with students to have informal check-ins with them and to be available uh, in in technological ways that maybe pre-pandemic we weren't doing so there has been um, a, 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 you know an off the scale rise in 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 the innovative and adaptive use of of technology and um, 
I, I believe at some point, do you know, I haven't I haven't remembered whether it's today or tomorrow, but um, um, uh, Shabnam Ahmed, I believe, is hopefully here at some point during the conference, and she has raised the profile of the use of compassion in social work supervision in new and innovative ways. And uh, one of the things I'm kind of passionate about is that practice educators um, enable other practice educators to learn and develop. And uh, Shabnam Ahmed is a is a practitioner, uh, a, a, a team manager in in Camden. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, it, it's useful to uh, have a look at the School of Shabs in Twitter and in as a YouTube um, channel to look at um, innovative ways of conducting practice education. Um, I think as well, uh, practice educators have uh, raised the topic of moral injury within social work. Um, it's too big a topic today for me to go into a, a big digression on. Those of you who know me well know that I am prone to the odd digression. Not today, Annie, not today. But I mean, I think practice educators are uh, at a, a, a forefront of enabling people to understand that this is happening. They're being honest with students about it. They're helping um, students cope with that gap be between aspiration of the work and the reality of some of the work that we're being asked to do. Anybody who does want to follow that up, then Siobhan McLean, who is um, a practice education um, guru uh, within uh, our own region on the 11th of May at 7 p.m. has a webinar uh, on um, moral injury. And if you were to Google Siobhan McLean and um, moral injury and social work, you will find um, the, the first webinar that she's conducted on this. And this is a follow up to it. And um, Maybe I could also say that Neil Thompson's uh, active work in promoting and supporting uh, workers, employees' well-being through Vigor Room is, is also a space that's helping people um, cope with uh, some of uh, the feelings that, that they have about the nature of the work that they're undertaking. But the, but the main point is that practice educators are leading in some of that. They're leading the conversation. They're participating in the conversations and bringing this to, to people's attention. And so throughout this social work, practice educators continue to be boundary workers. You work the boundaries day in, day out, of the boundaries between practice and education, uh, between education institutes and employer agencies, uh, the boundaries of passing and failing, dare I say, the boundaries of your roles as mentors, educators, assessors. Some of the conversations I've been listening to this year from the practice educator candidates uh, uh, becoming practice educators um, in stage two is there, what they hadn't anticipated at stage one is there they've been involved in um, enabling somebody to become a social worker who then stays within the agency and they find themselves as ongoing unofficial mentor to that person. Their practice educator role, their relationship with that person hasn't ended just because they are no longer that person's practice educator. So there's all kinds of um, boundaries that that that. Um, that practice educators are learning how to navigate, negotiate and work with. On the subject of assessment, may I say next? So as we, I think, know, one of our key roles in, uh, in practice education is gatekeeping um, the profession uh, a, a long time ago. Um, uh, uh, Dave Evans, uh, in a book on practice education in social care, wrote that, uh, you know, practice education is a political act. We are part of making decisions around who does and who doesn't join the profession. So uh, in our role as practice educators, which the profession uh, can celebrate about us, is that we are protecting the public and the profession from poor practitioners. Those practice educators who passed out students and those who fail them 
are supporting the next generation of social workers by ensuring that future colleagues are ready. Now, that does not mean to say I would not want to be misquoted as saying, you know, that Annie Murr is somebody who celebrates when we fail students. That is not uh, the point here. Um, and, and maybe when we fail students, we're not actually saying, please don't ever darken the doors of social work. We might just be kind of trying to say that you are not yet ready and you need more time. And that is a crucial role so that when we do pass students, we know that they are ready to join, enhance uh, the workforce and, and provide excellent services. Thank you. Next. OK, so our profession's appreciation of us is a uh, returning to Jane's haiku, is that we are hopefully creating uh, and contributing to great future workers. But I don't know whether any of you kind of spotted um, in the PCF um, refresh that PCF 9 on leadership changed a little and uh, we got the um, we got the use we got the term collective leadership PCF 9 develop personal influence and be part of the collective Active leadership and impact of the profession. And you know what? If practice educators aren't doing that, then I suspect we aren't doing anything. I mean, that is the, the forefront of what we are doing. We are um, educating, supervising, and we're mentoring others, that both those in coming into the profession and those developing within the profession. And in that role, we are contributing to collective leadership. Our use of social media, I mean, you know, the British Association of Social workers, um, people who are in Twitter, in Instagram, in Facebook, known and acknowledged as social workers and participating in social work debate in those spaces um, is, is a good and positive way in which we are uh, adding to the collectivity uh, of and leadership within our profession. We can respond to consultations on legislation. I mean, we we are if practice educators, because of their ongoing, because of our ongoing contact with students, um, are aware of, of changes in social work and social work education, not that other practitioners aren't through their update training and their CPD, etc. But we are in a position to respond to consultations. And I've popped the last one in, in terms of contributing to public inquiries, because, you know, uh, we've just had the terms of reference for the government's public inquiry into how the pandemic was managed. So um, once those terms of reference, the consultation on those terms of reference has now uh, over, I believe, um, and then we will actually have the how can we participate in the public inquiry and, and um, we can as practice educators, we can uh, become involved in that and use the knowledge that we have from our role to contribute uh, our thoughts on that process. OK, so. Uh, next. So I think then as practice educators, it is absolutely right and proper that we celebrate ourselves and uh, we accept, hopefully, uh, the praise and appreciation of others, maybe in a very modest way, but we um, nonetheless are not churlish enough that we should reject it, but accept the uh, the appreciation. We we can be proud of ourselves. Uh, we are appreciated by students. Um, there's much research that has said that what students remember long after anything else that they've done on their course has faded. What students remember are their placements and their practice educators. Um, even if you don't feel it, I believe you are as practice educators. Um, very, very much appreciated in the world of social work education generally fully, not just practice education. And hopefully uh, you uh, have an understanding of how much you are appreciated by the profession to which we all belong. So yeah, let's go celebrate. And next. And so then it is Undoubtedly now my absolute pleasure to welcome Neil Thompson to give the keynote speech. 
Neil is a highly respected person within social work in his role as a social work writer and educator. Hi, Neil. I've just uh, seen you appear. It's it's an absolute Hello. pleasure that you're with us. Um, your vital role, I would say, currently uh, in supporting uh, well-being among employees. But your address, Neil's address this morning, is about teaching anti-discriminatory practice, giving due heed to the pitfalls to avoid. Thank you very, very much. I've handed over to you a little early, Neil. Thank you for being there. And that's that's okay. okay. Thank you very, very much. If you just bear with me a second while I set up my PowerPoint file. Okay, can people see that now? I certainly can. Yep, great. great. I'll, I'll, I'll continue on that basis then. Right. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm really pleased to be with you on this important day, um, working with important people. And I certainly share Annie's view that um, practice educators are at the heart of social work ed education. Uh, you, you make a really important difference. Um, so I want, just want to echo that sentiment. It's something I've been thinking and saying for many years. OK, my focus, as you can see, is on anti-discriminatory practice and in particular on pitfalls to avoid in working with students around these um, uh, issues. I'm going to begin from a personal perspective, from my story, how I got involved in these issues way back in, uh, well, it was uh, actually in the uh, early 80s that I, I got started to get to grips with these um, issues. So as you probably gathered, I'm at the tail end of my career by now, not quite ready to hang up my boots, but uh, not far off. So um, the starting point for me is social justice. I had an uncle who uh, was a strong trade unionist and he was like a father figure um, to, to, to me. My father died when I was uh, three. And so my uncle John, uh, the trade unionist, was a key figure in my upbringing. And he taught me about social justice and the importance of uh, equality and so on and so forth. So um, by the time I went off to university, I just took social justice uh, as read, basically. You know, that I just saw it as fundamental to what we need to um, work uh, to, to, towards. But when I went into social work in the early 80s, um, what I found was that UK social work in particular was very heavily influenced by psychodynamics. There was a strong um, emphasis on basically what happens between your ears, as I like to call it. So a major focus on the psychology of the uh, individual. And I felt very uncomfortable with that because as I was learning about social work, I was learning about poverty and deprivation. I was learning uh, about all sorts of things that had their roots in society. All sorts of things that were closely linked to social justice or the absence of social justice in so many cases. And yet what I was being taught about was um, uh, psychological processes within the individual. So it just didn't fit for me. It just didn't feel comfortable. And I'm not saying that uh, individ process, psychological processes within the individual are not important. I'm just saying they're certainly not the whole story. There's a whole uh, lot more. So my initial encounter, shall we say, with social work and social work education was quite frustrating for um, me. At that time as well, social work values were very individualistic. And uh, important uh, social work values, you know, things about confidentiality, respect for persons and so on and so forth. Um, and I you know, fully supported all those values. So again, not wanting to dismiss uh, the importance of these values, but thinking again, this doesn't go far enough. You know, what, where are the values around social justice? Where are the values around equality and perhaps what we'd say today in terms of diversity and inclusion? and so on. Those seem to be missing from the, the, the picture. Everything was very, very narrow in, in, in my uh, view. So that, again, caused me some concern. 
But then things started to change when radical social work came along. And to begin with, radical social work was very strongly influenced by Marxist thinking. It, it, it was uh, a, a largely a critique around issues of class, saying that, for example, um, uh, the so many of the issues within social work are linked to class. They're linked to uh, poverty and deprivation, for uh, example. They are linked to the alienation of labour. They're linked to so many things that are all part of this Marxist critique, as I like to call it. And so I very much welcomed that. I started to feel that I was on home territory at last, recognising what today I would call a sociological perspective, that we were still wanting to value the contribution of psychology, but recognising that that needs to be complemented, not replaced, but complemented by a sociological um, pers perspective. And the beginnings of this were, uh, uh, the seeds as it were, were within uh, the Marxist uh, crit critique. So what started to happen as a result of this was, uh, or partly as a result of this, the radical social work movement that is, is that social work started to think about addressing discrimination and oppression, started to recognise that uh, processes of identifying certain groups as different easily led then to seeing those groups as being less than um, and so there's a sort of a hierarchy of groups and that's the basis of discrimination of not just identifying a difference because of course that's what to discriminate means is to identify a difference not just identifying a difference though but then treating certain people unfairly treating them as inferior or as a threat um, as a result of being different in some way as a result of their ethnicity, for example, as a result of the language they speak, their religion or whatever it may um, be. And so those processes of discrimination, those processes of unfairness then lead to oppression. So we started talking about anti-discriminatory practice, anti-oppressive practice, discrimination being the process, oppression being the outcome of that um, process or set of processes. Um, so triggered largely by the radical social work movement, we started to look at those um, things in the 80s. But then what happened as well around about the same time was that there was not just the Marxist critique around class, but also civil rights and anti-racist critique. So we had, for example, black pressure groups in things like social work is supposed to be about tackling social problems. But one of the biggest social problems at that time, as now, is racism. And yet at that time, social work was doing nothing about racism. It was all based on the idea that um, this classic um, phrase, this classic saying that was so harmful, we believe in equality, we believe in treating everybody the same, which meant we treat black people who are experiencing racism as if they were white people not experiencing racism. We believe in equality, we believe in treating everybody the same. Such a simplistic, um, dangerous, uh, false assumption to uh, make. So the social work world at that point came under pressure from certain groups and quite rightly so in my view um, for being really naive about um, uh, racism and that then added to the pressures from radical social work. You've not only got to consider class issues, you've also got to consider issues about race, ethnicity and therefore racism. Then uh, what we uh, got was uh, uh, the impact of feminism and the anti-sexist uh, crit critique. So again, roughly at the same time in, in the 80s, we had uh, women's groups, again, quite rightly, uh, saying that there is a problem with sexism, with patriarchal assumptions, patriarchal systems within social work. And other professions as well. We weren't the only ones who were um, being uh, criticised. So the feminist anti-sexist uh, critique was saying things like 
The vast majority of people who use social work services are women. The vast majority of people who provide social work services are women. And yet the, the vast majority of people in positions of power are men. So that's reflecting the patriarchal nature of society. But again, social work at that point was doing nothing about it, just taking that as rent, taking that as like normal and natural, um, which of course was not um, helpful. It was also pointed out that a lot of the problems that we encounter in social work, a lot of the challenges that the people we support uh, encounter are linked to sexism as well. So, for example, people started drawing links between depression in women and oppression and recognizing there were strong links um, uh, between uh, the, the two. So we, we'd had the uh, critique around class, critique around race and ethnicity, and now the critique around uh, gender, all um, pretty much around the same time, all part of a, a, a coming together of forces that um, pushed us towards taking discrimination and oppression um, seriously. What came a bit later was the social model of disability. So this was um, uh, disabled people basically saying that they were unhappy with the model of disability that was being used at that time, a me medical or individual pathology model. The idea that if somebody is disabled, it's because there's something wrong with them um, and that they don't fit in as it were. Um, so what the uh, critique in, around the social model of disability was about was basically saying, no, it's not an individual impairment, uh, to use their, their term, it, that um, disables people. It's society that disables certain uh, people. It's through the lack of wheelchair access, for example. It's the lack of um, facilities that would enable people with disabilities to engage fully in society. So it's a, pro a social process of exclusion is what disability is about, or a set of processes of social exclusion, not an individual pathology that we need to think uh, about. So again, that broadened the basis of social work. So by now, of course, we're getting a long, long way away from this individualistic psychodynamic model of when we're dealing with individuals and families, we need to look at their thought processes. Um, what was being accepted now is, yeah, that may be significant, that may be very relevant in a lot of situations, but we've also got to look at this broader, more holistic um, picture, basically. And then what came again a bit later was broadening the base. And what I mean by that is we started to talk about not just class, race and gender and disability, but also looking at how discrimination could operate on the basis of age, sexuality, language, religion and, and so on. So we started to get a much broader picture. So people started to criticise, um, for example, radical social work for focusing almost exclusively on class without considering um, race and gender. But then those people who were promoting uh, issues around race and gender were being criticised for, yeah, what you're saying is important, but you've also got to broaden this out because discrimination and oppression are much broader based than just these, um, uh, what I'll later refer to as big isms. Um, so that was the next stage in a sense, and uh, this was all part of my my career, my story in a sense, my upbringing in, in, in so, social work. Then much later came the idea of the diversity approach, uh, the idea that all we're talking about so far, all we were talking about so far is anti this and anti that. Um, and the idea of the diversity approach is let's look at the positives. Let's look at the fact that there are differences in terms of gender, ethnicity, ability, language, group, religion, and so on. See that as a positive thing. Value diversity or even celebrate uh, di diversity. So this brought a new angle, as it were, to anti-discriminatory practice, um, it, where it basically said one way, one important way of 
um, tackling discrimination and oppression is to value and appreciate diversity and focus on the positives of us all not being clones of one another. The fact that there is this rich diversity of, of cultural differences, linguistic differences and, and, and so on. And then more recently, there's been a focus on the language of inclusion, basically saying that if we don't value diversity, then what's happening is we are unwittingly uh, or sometimes wittingly excluding certain groups of people. They don't get to have a voice, for example, um, because we're not appreciating fully enough the significance of diversity. So that is where we're up to at the at the moment in a sense um, based on this like quick historical overview from my personal point of view this was not just the, the history of these issues but my history that this is what i've uh, lived through and try to influence so what i want to look at now then is move on to look at my contribution where have i played a part in in this so what I've discussed so far is how these issues have uh, influenced uh, me and my practice. I want to look now at how it works the other way as well in terms of um, what I've been uh, trying to say in, through my writing, my teaching, my training, my consultancy work, all sorts of things I've been involved in to try and make a positive uh, difference. Now, um, what I'm best known for, of course, is PCS um, and analysis. And so I'm going to um, say a bit about this um, for you. Um, so if you're already familiar with it, it's just a quick recap. If you're not familiar with it, then it's just a quick um, in introduction. OK, so what I found uh, in my early days, as I've mentioned, is everything tended to be very narrow and individualistic focusing on the person and I think that's important that we have that focus on the person I'm not certainly not uh, decrying that but what I um, uh, was unhappy about as I've said was we weren't seeing the bigger picture we were just focusing on the person without looking at the context without looking at the social and political factors that were significant in these circumstances so I started thinking about um, how we need to look more broadly at this. And part of that was to look at cultural factors. And by culture, I don't mean things like high culture, you know, opera and ballet and thing, things like that. I mean cultural in the sense of shared meanings, in the same way that we have like an organisational culture where it's based on shared meanings, taken for granted assumptions, unwritten rules, you know, sort of the way we do things around here. And so what I was aware of, or what I became very aware of in terms of discrimination and oppression was that um, there was a tendency, again, to see these things in personal terms, to talk about personal prejudice. And personal prejudice is significant. But it's only part of the story. What we have to recognise is much more discrimination is at a cultural level. It's based on stereotypes. It's based on these taken for granted assumptions about certain groups or categories of um, uh, people. And what's particularly significant about this is that because it's cultural, then what you get is um, people not realising that it's there. You have people, for example, making, say, racist or sexist assumptions without realising they're doing so um, because they're just reflecting the culture, their upbringing, how they were taught to think and, and so on. You don't have to think about this for too long before you start to realise that so much of discrimination and oppression has its roots in cultural assumptions. Think about, for example, um, racial stereotypes, sexist assumptions that were brought up with, you know, blue for a boy, pink for a girl. All this sort of stuff influences individuals at the personal level, but it's done through this cultural level, this cultural context um, that we're all part of, and that has a strong influence on us, usually without us uh, realising. But of course, it's no coincidence that there are these discriminatory assumptions and stereotypes, discriminatory language and so on at a cultural level because it reflects the structure of society. It re reflects 
a set of dominance relations. It's all about power in that sense. So it reflects the class relations that um, the, the radical social work people were talking about. It reflects the um, the racial and ethnic structures of society, um, the dominance relations uh, that the civil rights people started to look at and now firmly part of the anti-racist agenda. It reflects the gendered structure of society and so on. So it's this is about power relations at a structural level. Those power relations shape the culture. It's no coincidence that we have these cultural assumptions and stereotypes because they reflect and importantly reinforce that um, structural level. That cultural level then then reflects and shapes personal experiences, assumptions taken for granted, actions and approaches and so on and so forth. So that's PCS analysis in a in in a in a nutshell. And the reason I put this forward was that um, I was so concerned about this tendency to look at personal factors, um, the psychodynamic thing again, without considering the cultural factors and the structural factors. And even a lot of the um, radical critiques that were coming forward were not reflecting this either. So, for example, Marxist critiques, the radical social work critiques, talked about structural factors but didn't mention cultural factors. You've had sort of um, postmodernist and post-structuralist critiques that have looked at cultural factors but have little or nothing to say about structural factors. So I see this as a holistic um, approach to look at how the personal interacts with the cultural, the cultural interacts with the structural and in through these interactions they keep the wheels of discrimination and oppression turning. OK, so what are the benefits of PCS analysis? Let's just have a quick look at um, those before we move on to look at these pitfalls, that are the focus of the session. Well, first of all, it can apply across all forms of discrimination. So whatever it is you're talking about, whether it's ageism, it's uh, uh, discrimination on the grounds of uh, language, group, or, or whatever, PCS analysis is not a model or not an approach specifically around gender, specifically about race. It applies across the board. And I think that's really important because I think it's important that students and therefore in due course practitioners and managers appreciate that these forms of discrimination we're talking about are not separate domains. They interact and they influence one another intersectionality is the term that is currently being used to um, refer to this. I've often referred to it in the past as dimensions of experience and how they interact with one another. That It doesn't pay really to look at, say, racism in isolation. We need to look at racism as part of a wider picture of different forms of discrimination and therefore oppression. As I said before, discrimination is a process, oppression is the outcome, the result of that process or set of um, processes. So PCS analysis uh, applies across the board in terms of whatever form of discrimination you're looking at, you can use it to make sense of it. So it avoids focusing on only one level, whether that's the personal, uh, as in the psychodynamic approach, the cultural, as in the postmodernist approach, or the structural, as in the Marxist approach. It's recognising all three of these levels, personal, cultural and structural, are important, all play a part and they all influence each other. It's a constantly evolving situation, a dynamic situation as these levels inter interact. And perhaps one of the most important things is that students and practitioners find it easy to understand. Time and time again, people have told me, particularly students, that they didn't understand all this stuff about discrimination, oppression. They were totally um, bamboozled by it, just out of their depth until they came across PCS analysis. And then they said it started to make perfect sense um, to them. They could see how these different levels uh, interact and it gave them a tool um, for um, addressing some, some of these issues. And that is my other point I wanted to make, it can be used in practice, it's an analytical tool. Just a quick 
um, comment on the terminology. Um, uh, what it says in my anti-discriminatory practice book and in various other publications where I've talked about PCS analysis, what it says is precisely that PCS analysis, because it's an analytical tool. What I find, though, is in general, people often refer to it as the PCS model. And I don't have a problem with that, but I think PCS analysis is more accurate because I want to emphasize the point. It's an analytical tool. It's not just something for students to quote in essays to get a tick in the margin. What it's about is an analytical tool that can help them to look at what are the personal issues in this situation? What are the cultural issues? What are the structural issues? So it becomes a tool for practice, an analytical uh, tool, not just a model to read about, quote in an essay and then forget about. Um, it's a practice tool. So that's really important as far as I'm concerned for students. OK, now I want to move on to the um, pitfalls to avoid or some pitfalls to avoid, I should say, not the pitfalls, because um, I'm not going to have time to cover them all, but some important ones to look out for. All the ones I'm uh, going to mention here, I have found to be very common and also potentially very destructive. So um, what I want to encourage you to do is to be aware of these and to make sure that the students that you support are aware of these as well, that they avoid uh, these pitfalls where possible. I'm working on the basis of forewarned is forearmed. So there's no guarantee that this will work. You know, you can be aware, the students can be aware of pitfalls and still fall into them. But the more aware you are of them, the more aware they are of them, the less likely that is. That's the basis of what I have to say. So the first um, pitfall I want to mention is something I touched on before, which is the big isms. And what I mean by that is that I found that a lot of students think very narrowly in terms of anti-racism and anti-sexism. They're like the two major factors and they may perhaps occasionally think of ageism and disabledism and discrimination on the grounds of sexuality, religion, uh, all sorts of other things. What I've tried to encourage students to do, and I would be very happy if you did the same, is to think in terms of where there is difference, there is the potential for discrimination. And where there is discrimination, there is the potential for oppression. So it's any significant difference that can lead to discrimination. Um, it can be not just uh, around racism and sexism. Just let me give you a quick uh, e example. I once had a black social worker on my uh, on one of my training courses who was from Birmingham. And what he said to me and not just to me, but to the rest rest of the group was during his life, he had had more discrimination shown towards him because of his accent than uh, because of the colour of his skin. And at first I thought he was joking, but he then went on to give uh, ex examples of uh, this. Um, and so clearly racism had been a factor in his life, but because he had um, left the Birmingham uh, area some years ago, what he'd found was that um, there was some sort of stigma associated with that, which, of course, is a, a sad example of how discrimination uh, uh, works and a sort of a blight on that um, great city of Birmingham. Um, so um, that's what I mean by the pitfall of the big isms of just thinking very narrowly in terms of racism and sexism, because they what tend to get sort of the lion's share of attention and so on. But to think much more broadly of where there is difference, there is a potential for discrimination. Where there is discrimination, there is the potential for um, uh, oppression. Um, so that's the, the first um, pitfall to uh, avoid the big isms. Then there is favourite isms. And what this is about is where people are 
particularly committed to challenging uh, a certain form of discrimination. And it may be through personal experience, you know, it may be someone who's gay, for example, who wants to uh, challenge uh, anti-gay um, dis discrimination. And that's that's good and that's fine. But what can happen, I've come across this quite a lot, uh, is where people are strongly in favour of challenging a particular form of discrimination, they can lose sight of other forms of uh, dis discrimination. So it's it's like a variation on the theme of big isms, but it's where there is a favourite ism rather than just the big isms of you know the, the classic racism and sexism um, uh, focus. Uh, so uh, that's something to uh, watch out for as uh, as well is where there may be somebody who is strongly. Um, against a certain form of discrimination. That, of course, in, in its own right is a very good thing, but it may mean that there is no room for considering other aspects of um, discrimination and oppression. Then something that sadly we see less of these days, but uh, uh, sorry, thankfully we see less of these days, but sadly is still around, is what you might call a fear factor or to give it its technical um, term, dogmatic reductionism. And what this is about is where people oversimplify issues uh, around discrimination and oppression. That's the reductionism bit. They reduce a complex set of issues to a simple uh, issue. Um, and uh, the dogmatic bit is where they uh, tackle it in a rigid uh, way because what this does is it creates an atmosphere of fear. It creates a culture of walking on eggshells. People become frightened to say something in case uh, they are accused of being sexist or racist or ageist or somethingist. Um, so it's based on um, uh, people challenging, tackling discrimination in a very simplistic and rigid um, uh, way. Um, in in the uh, 80s, for example, this was a major, major um, problem with people saying things like, uh, if you're white, you must be racist, uh, all men are rapists, and so on and so forth. Um, very simplistic uh, oversimplifications of very complex, sensitive uh, issues and put across in a way that wasn't about learning and developing and uh, growing uh, understanding of the issues. It was about this is the right answer. So uh, issues around the use of language, for example, the so-called PC uh, issues. You can't say that word. Um, uh, why not? It's racist. What's racist about it? I don't know, but you'd better not say it. And that is a classic example of dogmatic um, reductionism. So complex issues around the relationship between discrimination and language were just brushed under the carpet and it became this don't say that word, which then, as I say, contributed to a um, culture of walking on eggshells, people being concerned. I don't know what to say in case I say the wrong thing, so I better not say anything. I better avoid these issues. For example, I have come across um, uh, teams of uh, social workers where a standing item on their team agenda is issues around discrimination and uh, oppression. But what will often happen, seen it so many times, is it'll go something like this. Whoever's chairing the meeting will say, right, OK, next item on the agenda, discrimination, oppression. Uh, anything on this? No, right, OK, then the next thing is, so um, people not want to say anything in case they got criticised because there was this like hostility um, uh, towards um, uh, people. The idea that um, uh, these are things, uh, these issues are best addressed through um, making people um, ashamed of themselves, making people feel uh, that it's it's not safe to engage with the issues. Very, very dangerous stuff. As I say, it used to be a major, major problem. It's got better over the years, but uh, don't kid yourself into thinking it's gone away. I still come across examples of this to this day. 
Then there's the um, pitfall of uh, missing the subtleties. And I'm going to give you two examples of this, as you can see, reciprocity in the medical um, uh, model. And so missing the subtleties is partly about this um, reductionism, oversimplifying complex issues. When we're talking about discrimination and oppression, we are talking about hugely complex um, matters. Um, so we need to appreciate that complexity, appreciate the subtleties. That's why we need an analytical framework with like PCS analysis to make sense of it. It helps us to appreciate, appreciate those complex dynamics. So reciprocity, what's this about? Well, I'm basing this on my wife um, Sue's work. She did a PhD on reciprocity in the lives of older people. And what this is about is uh, that in our earlier lives, we have the opportunity to reciprocate, to give as well as to receive, to be helpful and useful. And this is important. It's important part of our self-esteem, important part of our sort of spiritual fulfillment is this sense of being helpful and supportive and useful uh, that we can give and contribute as well as um, receive. We can help as well as being helped. That's what reciprocity is about, and it contributes a lot to us as um, as human beings. Um, just consider, for example, imagine you're walking down the road one day and a car pulls up alongside you and says, oh, excuse me, can you direct me to such and such a place? And you say, oh, yes, yeah, just carry on down there, um, take the second on the left, and then it's the first on, on, on the right or whatever. Doesn't that feel good? Doesn't it feel good to be able to help somebody to be useful? Um, and of course, it's a big part of the motivation for us uh, being in social work in the in the first place. But the focus of Sue's work in her PhD and in other publications she's done as a result of this is how older people um, will often be denied the reciprocity element. They'll be denied the opportunity to give, to contribute, to be useful. You know, it's the classic, oh, it's all right, love, I'll do that for you, and um, that sort of thing. And uh, this is, a, in a sense, a critique of our um, social care system, where what is often what often happens is that older people are denied the opportunity to give, contribute, and be useful. And that then is clearly harmful in terms of their well-being and potentially in terms of their health, because of course, well-being affects health too. So that is, in a sense, is a form of ageism. It's a form of discrimination that we are denying or tending to deny often um, older people the opportunity to give, to contribute and to be useful in ways that we probably wouldn't do or um, almost certainly wouldn't do to younger people. Now, Sue's focus was on older people, but it isn't and ageism, but it doesn't have to be that. If you think about mental health, um, people with mental health challenges, you think about uh, people with disabilities, and you're going to find similar issues uh, there to different extents, maybe, and in different ways, but it's still this denial of reciprocity as a form of discrimination. So what I'm saying basically is we need to encourage students to engage with the subtleties, not just think in simple terms. Engage with the subtleties, appreciate that there's more to discrimination and oppression than just the big isms or your favoritism uh, and, and so on. There's a lot to engage with, a lot to learn about. Then my second example is the medical model. Um, for many, many years, I have been writing, teaching and training in ways that challenge the medical model, the idea that it helps to put a label of mental illness on certain uh, people. Um, and my argument is that this is a form of discrimination, that we need a much more holistic understanding of what is happening when people experience mental distress. And to just simply put a label on somebody, say you're ill, um, is largely unhelpful. And um, as I say, I've I've written, taught and trained about this for many, many uh, years. But it's interesting that if you look at um, some of the literature around discrimination and oppression, you will find people who are strong advocates 
of challenging discrimination and oppression who then uncritically adopt a medical model of mental health problems, uh, who just slide into all those potentially oppressive assumptions uh, about uh, people. So again, we're back to that individualizing thing, the personal level. This is a person who has an illness rather than here is a person who is facing major challenges in their life in many ways. And we need a holistic understanding of that, uh, that situation in order to move uh, forward. So the medical model, as I would see it, is largely discriminatory, but that's often not considered under the heading of anti-discriminatory practice. But perhaps it will help your students if you give them the opportunity to think that through, to read up on critiques of the medical model. Not just mine, there's loads of people um, uh, who have written extensively around um, challenging this oversimplified idea that somebody who is facing mental health issues uh, is just simply ill. Um, very grossly oversimplified understanding, which has uh, discriminatory and oppressive uh, co um, consequences. That's the word I'm looking for. OK, so that's missing the subtleties. The next pitfall I want to mention is complacency. Um, classic example of this, and this, this I can remember this as if it was yesterday. Remember a student uh, say, saying to me once, oh, well, I wrote an essay about anti-discriminatory practice and I got an A for it, so um, I don't need to worry about that anymore. And uh, I had to be very tactful in uh, trying to challenge that complacency without destroying the students' um, confidence, uh, ba basically. Uh, and an example of uh, what I'm talking about here in terms of complacency uh, came up on a training course I ran when there was a white male social worker who um, said that he uh, had been brought up in a very multi-ethnic area. So uh, he was used to um, playing out as a child uh, with black and Asian children. He was used to going to a school with a high proportion of black and Asian uh, children. And so unlike some of his uh, white um, fellow students, he didn't feel at all uncomfortable around issues of challenging uh, racism. This had been part of his life. So, so far so good. But then what he told me and the rest of the group uh, was one day he was allocated a case relating to an Arab family and he just didn't consider that for a moment. He just sort of like jumped into his car and went off to begin his the process of assessment. And when he arrived, when he got to um, speak to the, the family, he realised he knew nothing about Ar Arab culture. He knew nothing about um, significant factors in relation to their way of life, um, their um, practices, their beliefs and so on. He felt totally out of his depth. That was complacency because he felt, yeah, I've got it sussed in terms of anti-racism. Um, I've brought up in a multi-ethnic uh, community. Um, this has been like bread and butter stuff for me. But he had never met or worked with a family of Arab uh, uh, origin before. So that was uh, a helpful example of how complacency can um, creep in. Um, so we don't want to discourage students and their confidence. We don't want them to be walking on eggshells and feel afraid and anxious about these issues. But it's about getting the balance right. We don't want them to become complacent either and think that they know everything there is to know. You know, I've been uh, studying and practicing these issues um, for decades, several decades, in fact, um, but I'm still learning. And that's the way it should be, is that this is not a fixed amount of learning you can do. And then that's it. You tick the box and you've got it. So it's that openness to learning, avoiding complacency that uh, we need to think about and need to encourage in, in students. 
And the next pitfall is getting lost in language. Uh, I said before that the relationship between language and discrimination is uh, really uh, complex and really important. And just saying don't say that word um, is not helpful. It's just uh, dogmatic reductionism. It's just oversimplifying and being overly rigid about issues. The way language affects discrimination is subtle and complex. We need to engage with those issues, learn about them. We need to develop what I call linguistic sensitivity, understanding how certain forms of language help and empower, certain forms of language hinder and disempower. And it's not simply a case of banning certain words. Um, but what can also happen is that um, people get lost in language in the sense that they um, adopt a rigid approach to language um, issues. Uh, for example, I've always had a problem with the term service user because I think the term service user, service uh, in particular, um, encourages a consumerist mentality, encourages a model of social work which is about providing people with services rather than about problem solving and empowerment and all the things that I see as being much more Im Im important. So I've always preferred the term client um, which is still widely used in, in the UK. It's widely used in other countries uh, around the world. But on a number of occasions, I have had um, people say to me, why do you use the term client when that's discriminatory? And I have said, what's discriminatory about the word client? And the usual answer I've got is, well, we were told at university that we should use service user because client is discriminatory. Yeah, OK, but what's discriminatory about it? And to this day, after decades of experience of this, I've not had a single person be able to tell me what is discriminatory about the term client. As far as I'm concerned, it's a respectful term. It's a professional term. Um, but um, this is another example, sadly, of dogmatic reductionism. Instead of critical thinking and when they've been told you shouldn't use the word client instead of saying, well, why not help us understand why you feel it's inappropriate. Instead of doing that, they just swallow it whole and say, OK, from now on, we'll say service user, even though that has consumerist um, connotations. Um, so that's part of this language issue as well. It's partly about getting away from this simplistic thing of don't say that word. Look instead at the, the complex relationship between discrimination and language. But it's also about not getting um, bogged down in you can't say that word. Um, you can't say uh, client. You got to say service user. Um, what's wrong with client? I don't know, but it's better to say service user. Well, is it? So hopefully that's clear what I mean. So basically what it's about in terms of students is encouraging this linguistic sensitivity, getting to think about language in complex and subtle ways and learn about it, not just fear it about, oh, what if I say the wrong word? There's much more to it than that. Then there's non-reflective practice. You know, we talk a lot in social work about reflective practice and critically reflective practice, and that's been a big part of my work um, uh, too. But what you'll often uh, get is non-reflective practice in the sense that people are under a lot of pressure, they're rushing, they're going from this task to that task, they got to get this report finished by Friday, and so on and so forth. And then what's happening is they're not thinking, they're just reacting. And if they're not thinking, they're just reacting, then issues about discrimination and oppression fall off the agenda. They're not only bypassing their thinking time, they're bypassing their values as well. You lose sight of values if you're just reacting to, got to get this done, got to move on, got to get that sorted. So this rushing that produces non-reflective practice is very dangerous. And then last but not least is safety bubbles or what are also known as security bubbles. And what that means is when people are under pressure, what they'll often do is withdraw into their own sort of bubble, their own safe space. They concentrate on their own um, uh, deadlines, their own reports and so on and lose sight of the bigger picture. And that is clearly dangerous. Now, we've got a bit of time for um, questions and discussion, but before we 
uh, do that. Just want to give you a quick overview of uh, this is um, a major part of my work, my anti-discriminatory practice book, now in seventh edition, promoting a quality book in the fourth edition. That's uh, where I was asked by the publishers because of the demands they were receiving um, to produce a more advanced um, book. So anti-discriminatory practice in introductory, promoting quality is more advanced. I've also produced a book you may or may not come across called Social Problems and Social Justice, which looks at discrimination and oppression in relation to social problems. And then mental health and well-being is got the subtitle of alternatives to the medical model. So that fits with what I was simply saying before. And then last but not least, I recently published this short anti-racism for beginners. And the reason I did that was because some of these pitfalls we've been talking about with the recent surge of interest in anti-racism, a lot of those pitfalls are coming back. A lot of those oversimplifications are coming back as part of this um, surge of uh, interest. OK, so that's what I want to say. I hope it's been useful and uh, uh, we've got um, some, some time now uh, for um, questions and discussion, I believe. Thank you, Neil. Yes, yes, we do. Can I just say a, a big thank you to, um, to to Neil and to Annie as well for for getting the the, the conference um, started for us. And um, thank you, Neil, for yeah, for providing those um, helpful insights into how we can support students as well with this big sort of topic. Um, so I think Annie, are you still there? Are you um, chairing the next section of the Q and A? The Q and A. Um, I am still here, um, but on the whole, I would direct people to Neil for Q&A. I'm around. Anybody wants to email me any questions? I'm very, very happy to answer them. Um, so I, you know I what do. I mean, Debbie, you know what yeah, I mean. I do. Yeah, thanks. Annie. <laughs> so opening it up then to, to people who, who might who may have a question. Um, so, yeah, we have James. Thank you, Deborah and, and, and Neil. Thank you very much. Um, I was quite intently writing down um, things about those eight things um, and somehow I didn't write anything against safety bubbles. It's probably a bit related to non-reflective practice, but um, would it be possible just to have a very brief pressy on what you said on safety bubbles? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, al also known as security um, bubbles. And the basic idea is when people are under pressure, as I say, they've got to get that report done by Friday and so on, that what they do is they withdraw into themselves. So they focus on their deadlines, their cases, their pressures, and they lose sight of the bigger picture, basically. So it's a it's an obstacle to teamwork, for example. I've done a lot of um, consultancy work around team development. And I noticed this, that this is what happens is when a team is under a lot of pressure, instead of pulling together and supporting one another in how to deal with that pressure, each member of the team then withdraws into their own bubble to focus on getting their report done, getting their um, deadline sorted and so on. And so it wrecks, if you like, teamwork at the very moment when they need it. But the same logic applies then to issues around discrimination and oppression. If you're just focusing on getting stuff done, then you're not going to be thinking carefully about um, what the issues are. Does that help? It does, yeah, values and things. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. And Tahara? Hello, good morning. My name's Tahara. And firstly, if I can just say, uh, you know, um, it's such a privilege to be on this platform uh, with yourself and the speakers. So it's been a really productive and a good learning experience, uh, Dr. Neil, with yourself this morning. Um, I know you mentioned the term service user and client. I know at Birmingham City Council we're using the term citizen. So I just wanted to check how does that sit as well? Yeah, uh, in fact, in fact, I'm I'm based in Wales, and that's the preferred term in Wales for the Welsh government. Um, is a citizen. Uh, back in, when was it, 2015, I think it was, or 2014, was it was the Social Services and Wellbeing Act yeah. um, was developed. And a key part of that major piece of legislation is 
trying to move away from consumerism, trying to move away from the idea that we're just here to provide services for people and the process of social work is rationing scarce resources, that trying to get back to the the traditional idea that social work is about problem solving, it's about empowerment yeah. uh, and helping people move forward. And it, so uh, to discourage the use of that term service user, um, the act um, refers to citizens, um, which I'm very much in favour of. So if that's the term you're using yeah. in your authority, then um, I think that's, that's a good move. Definitely, definitely. No, I appreciate that. And also, I really like the part when you were sort of talking about um, ageism and sort of people being denied, you know, if they're trying to offer support. It would be really useful because I didn't get a chance to write down the book that your wife, Sue, has written as well in regards to um, the, the older adults, because that would be useful to read as well. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm uh, probably the, the uh, she did she did a PhD which came out as a book, but I wouldn't um, recommend trying to uh, buy the book because it, it oh. it's, it's hardback only about 120 pounds. But you, <laughs> right, you, okay. you, you might be able to get it through a library. She's also done some articles. I mean, if yeah. you ser search online for um, uh, Sue Thompson, uh, reciprocity in old age, you're bound to come up with something. If if not, then I'm happy for you to uh, contact me and I'll dig out the precise details for you. That's smashing. I really would like to. Could I also have an email address for yourself? Because that really would be an honour, literally, to have that you know, to hand. Yeah. Well, actually, the, the easiest way to contact me is through my uh, website, which is neilthompson.info. Um, I've got, I was going to mention this at the end, I may as well mention it now, that I've got um, various learning resources um, available free of charge. Um, yeah. I've got um, a manifesto for making a difference, which I've been getting um, tremendous positive feedback about. I'm really proud and pleased about uh, that. So, you know, this is just not just saying to, to this, this to you, Tahara, but to everybody. Yeah. That you have a look at um, neilthompson.info. You'll find a lot of stuff there you'll find useful as a practice educator and your students will find useful as well. Definitely. Thank you very much. Really. I've, I've really gained a lot. Definitely. By right. being thank here and listening to yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, well thank you, Tahara. Thank you. OK. Do we have any more? There's, there's no more hands up, so I don't I don't think so. unless anyone else has a something they want to ask Neil before we finish this session. No, that's fine then. It just leaves me to thank you again then, um, Neil. It's been a real privilege to, you know, to have you with us and, uh, and uh, to hear you speak. And hopefully people will be able to access those learning resources um, that, you've, that you've mentioned as well um, on your website. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you so much. It's been a fantastic start to the conference, and I'm um, looking forward to uh, to the rest of the the workshops over today and tomorrow as well. Um, so thank you. So we will. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say, Neil, before we finished? Well, just first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's um, I'm always pleased to work with um, practice educators because that's been a big part of my work throughout my. Um, um, career, so I'm pleased and honoured to be part of your special day. Um, and uh, just the other thing is to reiterate the thing about neilthompson.info um, that, that you, um, I suspect you'll find a lot of useful stuff there. That's brilliant. Thank you. And um, Adam has just popped a, um, a note in the chat as well to everybody just um, regards that the slides will be sent out where available um, after the event. But there's also a link for feedback as well um, for, for this session. Um, so please do take the time to, to fill that out. Um, so we'll end this session here. Then thank you to everyone for attending and for your questions as well. And to Annie also. Um, and I um, hope to see more of you um, over the rest of the, the two days and the other workshops that, so that we have planned. We've got some great um, speakers as well um, for you. So, yeah. So thank you to everyone. Thank you. Bye. And take care. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.